are infected by COVID-19. 190 countries, and, and it is typical that countries like North Korea, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, they simply forbid the virus, which you can do if you are living in a totalitarian system. So the crisis now is truly global. This is certainly a difference to the financial crisis, to the Euro crisis, to the European crisis uh, of the refugees and uh, migration. The second one, and this is probably the most eminent distinction, the second one is it threatens the lives of the people immediately. There is not an indirect threat, there's a direct threat on the life of the people. And this will make, and it does make a difference in the discourse we are having now what to do in the crisis. I'm sure we will come back to this topic as well. A third difference could be that the contingency, which is anyway a um, characteristic of crises, uh, seems to be even higher. We do not know that much about uh, the virus, or the virologists do not know that much about it, and we don't know when uh, a next wave of infection will threaten human mankind. So the contingency, or if you want, the volatility, complexity, and so forth, uh, uncertainty uh, is certainly higher than in the crisis we have seen so far. Last point, uh, you may immediately say, yes, there was a crisis already, which is, has been similar. And this was in 1918 and 1919 when the Spanish uh, influenza broke out. We still don't know how many people were killed. At that time, the estimates run from uh, 20 million up to 40 or 50 million. Uh, I'm sure, or I, I cannot be sure, but I don't expect there will be um, a death toll which is similar to the Spanish influenza. So uh, what what seems a bit surprising for me, the contingency, I thought one of the core elements of crisis is that it's completely contingent and that you're not able to foresee. But you think, so this one is, the, the, the characteristics are different. No, I'm just saying the contingency which describes always deep crisis is here higher because uh, we know uh, if we have a financial crisis we have a certain set of instruments which we can apply to overcome the crisis but here um, you do not have we do not have a lot of knowledge what the virus uh, will uh, whom the virus will infect and especially we don't have a toolkit uh, which we uh, can apply in order to stop uh, the wave of infections. And, and I should add, which is typical, uh, a typical difference to other crises as well, uh, modern policy making has to rely on expertise. And uh, the expertise very often is coming from the outside. But again, in political crises and economic crises, uh, the politicians have some routines what to do. Here they have completely uh, to rely on medical experts, on virologists and so forth. And they have to believe them to a, to a certain extent. So the dependency on expertise from the side of politics is much, much higher now. Maybe this is then one of the reasons why, at least this is my personal impression, well, I should first say that I'm doing something, I'm kind of auto-censoring my, myself now, not to see the news too many times, because whenever I do, 
depending on the images and the stories they tell, um, I start to feel really affected personally. Um, so this is why I'm not all the time tuning in. But whenever I do, what I can sense is that exactly the lack of a toolkit, as you have been putting it, um, leaves many of our decision makers, politicians, uh, and others a bit helpless. Um, and this has two sides for me. It could be, it could be interesting to see them human, uh, not having all the answers when they are not there, because then it wouldn't be. Um, um, they would be making up maybe the story. Now they, they, I, I see them much more vulnerable. And on the other hand, the flip side to this is, and this leads to the next question, uh, to the cap capability of the governments to to govern, to be uh, in um, in their full possession of really making the right decisions, because this is uh, what what they are asked for uh, by us. Uh, the people. So is this helpful right now that they are not having a toolkit? Um, because it it makes them more accessible. They seem to be more human because we had also a crisis of credibility of, of politics before. Or is it on the other hand now difficult because this is the hour of the strongman uh, and authoritarian um, behaviors? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is very human not to have a toolkit. So uh, we are used uh, to have a toolkit for almost everything. Uh, what uh, we do not have, and I cannot talk about the medical uh, question, but what politics does not have, and this is quite surprising, it does not have a constitutional toolkit. So they are trying to fix the constitution right during the crisis. Just to give you an example, uh, in a case I know best, Germany. Uh, we do not have a clear uh, constitutional provision for the state of emergency. Uh, there was a long discussion going on from the 19, late 1940s up to 1968, up to now. In 1949, uh, the Allied powers uh, prohibited uh, the German uh, constitutionalist constitution makers to write down into the basic law and, uh, uh, and so to say, a small constitutional provision for the state of emergency. This has a lot to do with our uh, history, a lot to do with the constitution of the Weimar Republic and the misuse of certain articles there in the constitution. And what is quite interesting, the debate we had from the 50s to the late 1960s, where we finally got some uh, uh, provisions for the state of exception, uh, that there were different uh, positions of the main political parties, which, to say it already here, which disappeared now in the discussion we had during the last two or three months. The difference, and this is quite important to note because this uh, uh, uncovers a different understanding of democracy, the difference was that the CDU, uh, as the classical conservative party, I would call it the classical state party in Germany said, uh, state of emergencies are always the hour of the executive, so to say of the uh, government. This is a way uh, to phrases which we have heard from an very um, brilliant, but however, very right-wing constitutionalist Carl Schmidt, who plays an important role in the constitutional debate. So the CDU, the conservatives claim this is the hour of the executive. And the social Demo democrats at that time more progressive than they are uh, at present. They said, this is the hour of 
the legislative of the parliament. And the argument I find quite compelling. The argument has been in that moment, the executive, the government take over so much power uh, that uh, the parliament has to supervise the government very closely that they do not misuse the power. And what we have in the discussion now is that social democrats and christian democrats there is no difference at all they are all claiming this is the hour of the government this is the hour of the executive and what you said before this seems to be also the hour of strong men if you look at the surveys uh, uh, which look at political parties then you find an high premium for all those parties who are in government and uh, oppositional parties uh, indeed lose. This uncovers uh, also the desire of many citizens to look for strong parties where they can believe in. Last point, even such an idiot and full idiot like uh, Donald Trump, who failed completely at the beginning of this crisis, he uh, uh, went up uh, in the opinion polls. This shows you a very risky situation for democracy that the people believe now in the executive and they may not care that much about uh, basic rights, human rights, which the executive uh, takes away from them. Thank you. And um, uh, I'd like to mention something that is uh, written in the chat now because, um, well, of course, in a way, um, we are based here in Germany, Europe, and I was about to ask you how you can, um, how you would um, see the situation in other, in other countries, like in a comparative uh, perspective, and what uh, our friends um, that are guests today are sharing that this is also what can be seen um, in the battle between the executives and federal system like governors uh, versus the White House and it seems to be also explored in Mexico so maybe um, how, how do you see um, moving towards the, 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 the performance of different regimes and of different systems is can you give us some some insight on, and you mentioned it at the start, how the regime, regimes are behaving differently? Uh, so regarding how they cope with the crisis, how they are able to um, protect citizens. Um, just to give you one example, I'm in a, a mailing list out of very uh, IT focused people um, that are really trying to um, do some rapid prototyping in Spain to come up with solutions uh, in the situation over there. And they're really blaming the government over there for not having reacted on time. So can you give us some, some insights on how you see the comparative perspective between the systems and how they behave? Uh, it's it's not so easy because all the data we see in the uh, daily news are to a large extent flawed. Uh, we do not know how many people are infected and all these Johns Hopkins University statistics, they all only talk about the registered uh, uh, infected people, but there's a complete different sort of testing, sampling, and reporting in those countries, in the countries uh, we can look at. So the data do not tell us very much, even with data governments uh, make uh, politics and uh, forge uh, policies uh, which are seemingly based on these data. But put these data for a moment aside and look uh, how different political regimes, not only different countries, political regimes are behaving. 
uh, we can compare uh, roughly between authoritarian and democratic regimes. Authoritarian regime, the classical case here is where the virus took its origin uh, and is China. China failed obviously at the beginning uh, to report fast about this infection than the virus, but then later on it was completely or it was incredibly effective in shutting down public life, uh, isolating 11 million of uh, people, not citizens of people, of subjects in Wuhan and actually, uh, so to say, uh, controlling more than 800 million people. This can be done only in authoritarian regimes and to some extent they were effective. On the other side, so to say, from even from a geopolitical point of view, the United States of America, they again uh, having a kind of, uh, yeah, macho president who said such a virus is a minor thing. And he did not pay uh, sufficient attention uh, to uh, order the first measures against it. So complete failure at the beginning as well. But then what it uh, uncovered in the situation as well, they were even the, one of the richest countries, technologically most advanced countries failed uh, effectively to protect uh, the lives of the people, especially in New York and other hotspots. So uh, on the one side, you have an authoritarian regime, which at the end with force authoritarian measures was quite uh, effectively uh, and uh, on the other side, you had a highly developed country, which was quite ineffective. So uh, at the end, uh, you cannot really say whether the regime uh, is uh, very uh, important for fighting the crisis. According to my point of view, it's more how prepared a state is, how strong and credible in the eyes of the citizen a state is. We call it stateness, for example. And uh, on the other side, uh, how well prepared the medical system is. And the third one is how is a society organized? And to put a very complex thing uh, very simply, I would say, these are the three uh, major points. If you have an, a state with high uh, stateness and trust of the citizen, uh, if you have a society which is not completely individualized, uh, which are on the one side could be Confucian societies with a strong collective will, to follow uh, the common good. Uh, and uh, this is quite uh, important. But if we look only to democratic systems, you have a complete performance as well. Italy and Spain obviously uh, were not very effective in protecting their citizens. You have cases like Germany, and this is not, not at all a national pride. Uh, you have uh, countries like uh, Germany, you have countries like Sweden, Denmark, Austria. They were quite effective. They were quite effective, but here you have uh, countries with a high and stable stateness. And you have not uh, societies like in Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, very effective uh, fights uh, uh, and policies of the government against the virus. Uh, but you have a situation here where the people follow the government. This seems to be good for effective implementation and accepting measures of the government on the one side. On the other side, uh, it seems to me, and maybe I'm overcritical with my own country, it seems to me uh, that we see a typical German phenomenon. 
And this is what uh, Theodore Adorno has once called the authoritarian personality. The citizens do not behave like citizens, they behave more than uh, more like subservients, like uh, subjects, uh, uh, and they uh, forgot to be critical citizen, citizens. And this is one uh, critique from my side against the intellectuals of our countries and the people we do not hear any dissent. It's coming up only from the economy, but not very much from the citizens themselves. Hmm. Um, so we have been also, there we have been raising some questions, there have been raised some questions in the chat and some, um, some discussions going on. Um, Seeing what happened with the, the, the world superpowers now, China and the US, can you dwell a bit on, on, on that? Um, so what, of course, nobody's able to, to look into the future, but um, what is your take on the question how all this, um, the, the US disaster that we're uh, witnessing from, from far away, how this uh, could play a decisive role for the rest of the world. We have anyway, uh, we had before the crisis a beginning tectonic shift in the geopolitical constellation, meaning the century, the 20th century was certainly the century of the United States of America, especially the second half. Now we have this emerging authoritarian power, China. And what we see uh, in, the, uh, in the trade wars and the economic struggles between the two countries, mostly launched by the United States, one has to say, uh, that there is a shift uh, away from uh, the superpower U USA towards China. And if it is true, and we cannot see it clearly for the moment, but if uh, it is true what we think it uh, what will happen, meaning that uh, the United States turned out to be not very effective of fighting the crisis, they will lose credibility. They will lose credibility uh, 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 around the globe. This does not mean that West European countries, for example, uh, would think uh, China could be an alternative. But if we look to Africa, if we look uh, to Asia, then uh, it might be another step uh, of uh, the American decline and, uh, and the uh, advance of uh, the People's Republic of China. And uh, let me add the following. What we have seen here is uh, that the United States of America is acting aggressively. This is typical for a superpower who witness or who perceives uh, that uh, they will lose power. So even in geopolitical, in the geopolitical constellation, our world will become more volatile than it was in the past. Yeah, so means more VUCA. Welcome to VUCA. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, and my take on this crisis is that the illusion we humans had that we are in control of things is just vanishing and is gone. And what I have been sensing, at least in my corporate environment, and I'd say this is true for national um, politics, as far as I can see and understand them, is that we have been managing in a linear way our systems. Um, and now the time has come for us to face that this just doesn't work. Probably it never did. Uh, but it does better when there is no crisis. And when you're in the crisis, then you start moving from complexity to chaos. And of course, this is the least desired um, status of, um, of a system. So this is why what normally happens then is that it starts narrowing down. And going 
towards this question of narrowing down. So will there be a fallout for, for democracy? So we had an, an interesting conversation going on in the chat on if the question is if democracies are performing better than dictatorships and probably there, the, this will be just uh, answered uh, way in the future. Um, but back to the question, will there be a fallout for democracy? And of course, you are having a bigger picture than just Germany. Uh, and we have people here from all over the planet. So what is your take on how democracy might be transforming uh, due to this crisis and due to the restrictions to some fundamental rights? Um, can you dwell on that a bit? Yeah, uh, again, with all the cautiousness, uh, uh, political and social scientists should have if they look into the future. And there's a famous saying, by the way, by Mark Twain. And he said, prognoses are very difficult, especially if they look into future. Uh, so uh, uh, we should be cautious. but where I see a certain risk, or let me put it this way, I see three probably more negative than positive fallouts of the crisis. The first is a political and democratic one. If we have these state of emergencies for uh, two months or three months, and they will come a kind of recurrent infection waves, politicians will tend to go back to emergency measures. And emergency measures always means less, less democracy, more, more power to the executive. And the people could get used to it, especially if governments are successful. And then uh, our Western democracies, at least in Europe, will not become outright autocratic regimes. But uh, there will be a um, tacit uh, transformation going on, which makes our uh, and transforms our active uh, civil societies and political societies in more apathetic ones where the people are satisfied if governments are successfully performing in uh, whichever respect. So it could become a kind of return to a more, uh, to a stronger belief in, author in authorities, which I see as anti-participatory and uh, not very uh, enlightening uh, democracy and make political life more par participatory. The second one is the European Union. We all have been proud in Europe uh, and especially uh, Germany with this horrendous uh, uh, pa uh, historical past between 1933 and 45 to overcome a narrow national uh, politics and policies. And what we saw up to now in the crisis was a triumph and a return of the nation state against European integration. European integration or Europe, the European Union simply did not take place in the first uh, six or eight weeks of the crisis. And the executives of the nation, of the member state, they even did not listen to the European Commission. They broke uh, several rules of the European Union because they thought they will come out better if they close all the borders and they follow their national way. The European Union was anyway under stress before, the stress will be even bigger. And uh, since I saw Christina from Budapest, one word on Hungary uh, here, uh, the uh, Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, used the window of opportunity to further aut autocrise uh, his country. 
And uh, if the European Union would follow their rules, uh, they had uh, to at least suspend uh, the membership of Hungary. This will, of course, not take place because Poland will raise the finger and will not uh, accept the majority voting of the European Union. So the second one is uh, the European Union will uh, get into more stress. Last point, and here I'm more insecure, uh, society. What we have seen uh, during the crisis was an emergence of solidarity, of a common sense of belongingness, and understanding what a community is made for. This was a positive point. Uh, but uh, we, what I think we understand this to some extent wrong, because we want to understand it in a kind of, how can I say, mm, social romanticism, believing in a Rousseauan uh, manner, now uh, the good human behavior becomes visible. What we know out of almost all crises is that the conflict within the society will become uh, sharper, will become more polarized. And this is what I would expect because we will have winners and losers uh, coming out of this crisis. And to have new winners and losers mean we have more conflicts in the society distributional conflicts in the society, and this will be even in rich societies, but even more in those societies we, uh, uh, who cannot rely on uh, such kind of wealth. Last point, if we, and we see this discussion already, and I, uh, I uh, have uh, the, uh, idea or at least the suspicion that Germany will not play a very um, ideal or a good role. This means uh, if it comes uh, to reorganize the economy of the most hit countries in Europe like Italy and Spain, this cannot be done uh, without the rich countries uh, of the European North and Germany as uh, most, uh, uh, the biggest of those countries in the forefront. And uh, people in Spain, in Italy and France, they were key players in uh, challenging Germany that they have to contribute. And what we thought uh, for some extent in the situation that right-wing populists could lose, could uh, get out as losers out of the uh, crisis because they lost their main topic, uh, which is migration and which is uh, the kind of discrimination of uh, immigrants in the European countries. But what will happen is the following, or I have the suspicion, uh, Germany uh, will uh, certainly contribute something, not what France and Italy and Spain want uh, to uh, get the, the economy going in those countries again. But at that moment, the right-wing populists in Germany will stand up and will argue, uh, we are already are also living in, in an economic misery and we have to take care of the poor people and those people affected by the crisis. And we should not send our money uh, to the European South. And many people, uh, and probably if even up to 50% in Germany think we are already giving too much money uh, to the European Union and to the Southern countries. They do not understand that Germany is the biggest benefiter of the uh, European Union. So there will be a struggle within the European Union and the right-wing populists will rediscover the topic of the European Union and will uh, mobilize against it. This will be uh, 
one of the out, uh, the fallouts we might have to expect. So I was about to ask you, will there be an European Union in five years from now? And if it's even more contested by right-wing populism, uh, this question is, uh, 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 well, it, it, it's more important probably to raise that question. So will there be a European Union? And maybe to add on that, I'd say within and after COVID-19 is just before all the other crises that are already lining up in front of us. So is this body able to provide answers that are needed? What about it? Now, what is clear uh, that the, uh, the national uh, way to solve crises like a um, global crisis uh, uh, which we are facing now, like the climate crisis and even trade crises we have, there is no way that we can find national solution. But this is rational thinking in politics. Uh, many people uh, will not be convinced about it and not only in Germany or not uh, only in Eastern Europe and other Western European countries, you see it very much in the United States as well. US, uh, USA first. And uh, this uh, may come back, this political virus may come back to Europe and in fact the thinking of the people that they might come out of these kind of crises better if they follow the national way. At least in Germany, I see this uh, risk. Uh, we will have in five years uh, a European Union, but I don't expect uh, it will be the same as we have seen in uh, the 1990s or after 2000. It will uh, certainly one where the member states will play more the national card driven uh, by uh, the right wing populist in their countries because they will, re uh, they will discover that you the European integration is a major issue where you can mobilize at least one third of the society. And uh, it is uh, countries like Italy where uh, the right-wing populists uh, could take over again. And this might uh, then uh, strengthen the centrifugal debt tendencies we already see in the European Union. So it will be more an European Union as Charles de Gaulle has once said of father lender of nation states than a better integrated community. And uh, what about the one big question we have already coming to an end of our conversation and also then opening up, of course, for um, uh, a dialogue with uh, the guests of tonight. The big question, are we witnessing the end of globalization as we knew it? No. This is, um, I, 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 read, uh, I read some articles or essays, let's say, essays on that. Uh, the economic costs uh, would be so tremendous that at least part of the policy making will be uh, rational and capitalism is so much stronger than uh, social romanticists may believe. We will come back to those rules capitalism will dictate us. Uh, it sounds a bit Marxist and I'm not ashamed of it, by the way. Uh, and uh, it will, uh, the, the rules will not fundamentally uh, change. They will at, at the beginning and uh, we already heard these voices that uh, nation states said uh, we have to think about, uh, uh, I even don't find the English word, the, uh, of the production value changes uh, 
which uh, can be broken if uh, Mercedes uh, produces parts of the cars in uh, in China or in Eastern Europe, and uh, they need that this uh, uh, value change uh, a, a, a chain will uh, be unbroken. But there is no way to go back. And even Trump, with this uh, US first, uh, will not, uh, so to say, go back to a splendid capitalist isolation. So I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It may strengthen some institutions and hopefully, and I, I would uh, hope for it, supranational institutions like uh, the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, which helps us uh, to, uh, to counteract again those kind of crises we see now. But please don't expect that the era of globalization is over. It will not be over in communication as we can see here in the, uh, in the audience of the participants. We are buying products all over the world. We have an hom homogenization of certain a popular culture, no, there will not be an end of uh, globalization. So value change, no, value chains still prevail over value change. This was just a Freudian um, misspelling then. Thank you very much, Chair. No, no, it's, it's more about value change uh, on some parts of our discussions in the social media, for example, because we both were saying you don't believe in this idea of a portal that is opening up now for more uh, human connections, less capitalism, or at least less um, high speed capitalism. So you don't believe uh, in that. This is my what I understood from from your last elaborations. You're, you're not really hoping for something that could be more sustainable and more um, equal chances for more people. These are probably uh, two different things and I, um, I would need more time uh, uh, to delve uh, really deeply in. Uh, a more egalitarian structure, a more egalitarian distribution of wealth. Uh, uh, here, I, I'm not uh, too skeptical. Uh, and uh, globalization can take on different forms. And, uh, countries can see that there is room of maneuver for better social policy, for better, what I, I'm hoping for as a positive outcome of this crisis, better medical system. We now see how important it is and we now <laughs> see that the neoliberal version of globalization has uh, dismantled uh, these private and public health system. Also uh, in the uh, un in, in United Kingdom, you see it in the National Health Service. And in the United States, you see that those who die first are the poor people who do not have a sufficient uh, a medical care and medical aid. So this could be one of the pos positive things but global capitalism will survive. And we have seen, and probably more important, many people don't think this for the moment, uh, a more important transformation of the world was 1989 and uh, 90, so to say the crumbling and collapsing of the authoritarian communist world. And what happened? 
these countries crumpled and became capitalists, including China, including Russia. These are different versions of capitalism. They are gangster capitalism, state capitalism, but they spread all over the world. By the way, this was already nicely described in the Communist Manifesto in, in the first pages in uh, 1848. So Fukuyama, who um, who prognosed in 1989 the end of history because he, claimed, he argued this is the final victory of political liberalism and of economic liberalism. He was not right with political liberalism because we have strong authoritarian or autocratic states. He was more right about, uh, so to say, the economic order capitalism survived and uh, this is a kind of of wrong utopian uh, thinking if we now believe the globalization will fundamentally change its economic outlook okay sorry that i do not have better news no well and maybe it's not about news um maybe it's more about how um we still believe in uh something that could be worth fighting for in the best sense of the word fighting for um and yes you're getting your wine um this is exactly what we were suggesting now to have another glass but i would like to conclude our conversation now sharing with you something that has been put in the chat by sharon from south africa uh she says that your point on societal shifts is already evident uh, so they are already experiencing a significant shift in communities supporting each other, while the impact of the lockdown is showing up the massive chasm between wealthy and the poor. So um, there is a tremendous challenge and hunger is increasing. Um, and this is a not so um, bright uh, outlook. Uh, we weren't expecting it either. and. Um, now we would be happy to um, have you contributing to uh, to this dialogue. Um, whoever feels um, compelled to open the mic and uh, raise your questions directly with uh, Wolfgang, we have been trying to pick up on on some that we were reading right now, Annette and me in the chat. Um, but please come in and unmute yourself. And Vladimir from Prague. That's right. Um, yeah. Many thanks, uh, Wolfgang, for this uh, fantastic introduction. Um, one small point uh, for clarification. Well, uh, we all witnessed the dominance of German ordo-liberalism in economic thought. Is that still such a united front uh, in Germany now? Or is uh, German thinking about these uh, rules and procedures which were so important last century and still this century? Uh, is the uh, uh, internal sort of differentiation going on? Is there a, uh, sort of change uh, coming because uh, the criticism against the ordo liberal sort of impact of the ordo liberalism on European economy is growing not only on in the south but also in Germany. Thank you very much. A very sophisticated question, uh, 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 Vladimir, and I don't want to give uh, marks. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the quality of the question. But it is a sophisticated one because it shows that Germany, it's not a classical neoliberal country. It has been an ordo liberal country. And you could see it if you compare, for example, the health systems now in the crisis. Uh, it is a different health system, even with all these uh, deficits it has than we have in the United Kingdom or, of course, in the United uh, States. Uh, 
But if you think about that there could be, so to say, a social democratization or a greening of the economic structure and policies, I don't expect a social democratic democratization. The social democratic party is too uh, weak. Uh, there's a chance for a more greener economy because uh, the Greens have a powerful electorate in times of the higher echelons of the society. And uh, however, uh, it and capitalism can change. Capitalism can become greener. I don't have any doubts about it. It's an extremely adaptable economic uh, system. So I don't expect uh, in Germany and, and true change uh, in the eco economic policy, but we do not know uh, whether the exit from the economic crisis, which we will witness during the next half year or so, whether it is a an, an, uh, an clear V, a strong decline, but a very fast uh, upward trend as well, or we have a strong decline and then a lingering on a rather low level, a new form until it uh, uh, begins uh, uh, strengthening the economic growth as well. And if we have such a long lingering of non-economic growth, this will probably uh, probably uh, polarize the societal uh, struggles even in our society. So uh, maybe I have too little fantasy to think about a more social economy. We will not become an outright neoliberal version of capitalism. We will have this kind of ordo liberal form with a rather strong welfare state and this even you have to uh, accept this kind of empirical fact, even if you are critical of, uh, against many things happening in our country. What about the point that uh, Mark was making, Mark Saxer was making, and, and he actually wrote about it, the decoupling that a lot of people are talking about now, the decoupling of um, um, globalization. So not, not the end, but um, it clearly, a clear change as countries will probably look more into how the um, what kind of supply chains, for example, they really need, how they can cut back on supply chains, how they can produce more within the countries, and and so on. If we talk about a real traumatic decoupling, then it would mean a break with globalization. Well, if and it's if it's a gradual one, if it's if it's an, if it's I, I don't know ten twenty percent of that that pictures, even if it's a gradual one and and um, it might significant, it might not be the end of globalization, but it might change the face of globalization uh, significantly. But if the decoupling, uh, let's put an example. If uh, the United States now would continue to say this is unfair trade and uh, the Europeans and the Chinese in different forms are cheating us, so to say in the words of, uh, of Donald Trump. And if they would argue for a stronger economic isolation or a decoupling, then uh, the European states, uh, in front again, Germany is so much dependent on uh, exports that they cannot, if they are rational in economic terms, they cannot really embark on an avenue where they decouple from the rest of their trade partners. So I'm, I'm still believing they are in an economic sense too much rational than believing it. And, uh, Let's put it in another way. Uh, there are already decoupled uh, countries, whole Africa, mm. it decoupled mm. from, mm. so to say, being really integrated into a global uh, economy. Uh, it very much depends how uh, China and the United States will reacting 
but there could be even if they would go more into the direction of an economic uh, decoupling, then I would expect a reaction from uh, Europe to integrate uh, even stronger in order to counteract the negative economic effects coming which, from such a decoupling. Which would significantly phase, uh, uh, change the face of, of um, um, globalization. If he, I mean, if he could imagine that indeed Europe thinks, and um, what is already happening actually, that, that production from China is, um, is um, brought back onshore, so there's this whole phenomenon in, of onshoring, um, and Europe would decide, okay, maybe it makes more sense to um, strengthen cooperation between our countries, but less with, um, with um, Asia, less with, well, Af Africa, it's, it's uh, neglected anyway, or less, less with the Americas. That would be a very, very different, that would be more kind of internationalization. That would be a fundamental categorical change to international relationship and international economics, which might be an outcome of, uh, of this crisis. If I just check in there, I mean, I think deglobalization is a really bad term because it suggests something what's not happening, which means that there's a breakdown of globalization. But what we do see in Asia already is that uh, countries retreat from China. Uh, Korea and Japan are doing this as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think US pressure has a lot to do with that. The US uh, mm -hmm. uh, big companies are also retreating from China. So mm -hmm. what is actually emerging is not so much a deglobalization as uh, less complexity of the world yeah. economy and interdependence. What is happening is that we see the emergence of trade blocks. Yeah. And that is happening most importantly with standardization uh, uh, in terms of technology. Think about uh, computers uh, and these kind of platforms. They are being produced against each other. And it is the geopolitical factor. If you look at what happened with 5G in Europe right now, how much pressure the US puts on the export of technology and actually blocks the entrance of China into the market. So we see the emergence of blocks. I think that's what's happening. Deglobalization is, is not actually a very helpful term. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Which Mark. actually has nothing have, to do with I, COVID. Sorry, but... Imke. I have, I have some raised hands there. So, sorry. Uh, Veronique and uh, Christoph. Yeah, I was, I was interested by the remark uh, Wolfgang made in the beginning on how capitalism and democracy in a way are misbehaving and with negative results. Could you elaborate a little bit um, on that topic? Uh, could you repeat, I, uh, what do you mean by uh, misbehaving? That's what I, I heard you say, something in the sense that capitalism and democracy were actually misbehaving together, which is not the takes. I read it as they are not getting the best out of each other and that might have negative results. I was more interested in how you see that, uh, that dance of the two together in a way. Uh, my argument would be, and this is, has nothing to do with the crisis at present, uh, my argument is uh, there are different principles ruling uh, capitalism on the one side and democracy on the other side. Uh, and there are certain incompatibilities. To give you an example, uh, capitalism uh, is based on uh, individual uh, economic interests and on property rights. Uh, democracy, at least in theory, is based on uh, equality. All the uh, citizens have to be equal. Uh, in capitalism, inequality is a major driving force for uh, the economic actors. And this is not the case in democracy, where at least, again, in theory, democracy has to be uh, oriented more to the common uh, good. So uh, the uh, again, and the if we vote for uh, politicians and vote them into power, 
and then are realizing that they cannot do very much against, let's say, uh, a dominant fiscal or monetary policy. If uh, this is dictated, so to say, by financial markets, very famous, I still have it in my ears in the uh, financial crisis and the Euro crisis, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel said, you parliament, you have to decide in five days about these financial support systems. And if you don't do it, the financial markets turn into turbulences. And this means who then is the real sovereign? Is it uh, the democratically elected government or is it uh, very much about financial markets? So here democracy and the idea of self-governance of the citizens uh, clashes with certain rules, logics, or, and imperatives of the capitalist economy. There are convergences, there are compatibilities. I would not deny, for example, uh, that uh, markets, if they are not oligopolistic or monopolistic, uh, they are a certain counterweight or they can be a counterweight, uh, so to say, to too much political power. Nevertheless, what we have seen in times of a uh, certain version of uh, globalization is a dominance of markets and certain policies uh, which uh, are no longer under democratic control. Thank you, uh, Veronique. Uh, I have Christoph. Uh, Christoph I'm good seeing you. Uh, it's been a while. Hi, uh, Christoph. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the invitation. Are you in Colorado? Uh, no, I just uh, fled Colorado and I'm back in Berlin a week ago. So Better I mean, health system. Yeah, it's, it's not good in America. That was actually one of my questions. Um, uh, Volk and I worked for a long time on uh, critical junctures together. So the corona pandemic is clearly a critical juncture. But I believe it is a critical juncture that will impact states very differently. Right, so it might point out certain deficits, let's say in Germany on, um, you know, how we handle distance education or the digital revolution or whatever, where we are indeed behind. Uh, but I think in the United States, it leads to a very fundamental crisis of the state and, uh, and state authority. I mean, the United States is at the brink of falling apart, I think, as the United States. Um, so to me, the question is, uh, if we look at uh, the corona pandemic, uh, will the impact not vary fundamentally um, between countries? Um, and then the second thing that I would like to mention is that when we have critical junctures, we need often a change agents to really pull things around. And I just don't see it right now. I don't see any change agents that would actually bring us towards, for instance, a sustainable future, or, um, you know, that, for instance, would pull the United States towards a more social welfare um, state, uh, and thereby kind of try to harness um, the, these, these tremendous conflicts that are, that are happening there right now. So I was wondering how you see which countries will be impacted and, and how, and where will it be in your opinion, worst, and where will it be just okay? Hmm. Probably you know uh, it better for the United States than I do. As so often, what I expect, uh, and these are not the most powerful countries, but probably the most uh, egalitarian and well-governed country, countries, Scandinavia, the Nordic countries will come out pretty well again out of the crisis. And this could be a teaching saying, look at these countries. However, these countries, this is what we have seen in the past, are too small to change, so to say, our way of thinking. If 
Denmark or Sweden would be as big as le at least as Germany, these uh, countries would become easier role models for other countries. And we always hear uh, the argument, yes, Denmark, five million people, you cannot compare it. Uh, you can compare it, but at the end of the comparison will be nice countries, uh, well organized, people trust their governments more than in any other regions of the region of the world, and which is even more important, the citizens amongst themselves trust the, uh, themselves much more than the people in Southern Europe, not to talk about Latin America or Africa. So uh, they will come out pretty good out of the crisis, and I expect Germany as well. Uh, uh, the pandemic was at least up to now not so disastrous as the epidemiologists uh, have forecasted it. 5,000 uh, dead people is an incredible death toll. But if you look back to 2017 and 18 in the winter, there was just a regular uh, influenza which killed 25 thousand people. So we will have a discussion about science-based policies probably after it. But Germany will come out uh, at the end, I expect, rather uh, well. In the United States, you, you said uh, something which made me, uh, so to say, uh, shivering and frightening. It could be that if the United States of America uh, give up, so to say, a rest of internal cohesiveness as belonging together. And this, uh, if the crisis uh, will kill more and more people in America and at the end more than in most of the other countries, then this could be a reaction. California would uh, uh, go maybe in a different uh, uh, direction, what it does anyway. Uh, uh, but if you have these tectonic shifts in the United States of America, uh, the rest of the world will feel something out of it. And this is where we have risky situ situations. About the critical juncture, I've never thought about, uh, even we worked uh, on this, uh, meaning that there is now a um, crossroads where quite different paths are uh, diverging from each other. It's a good metaphor, and uh, but I have to confess, I have to think about it more uh, quietly than I can do when all these people are looking at me. <laughs> well, so my personal uh, take, <laughs> And this is completely on what I'm receiving as vibes. And this is completely not science, but this is completely what I'm sensing is that this is a critical juncture and that I hopefully won't be experiencing another one like that in the time that I will be spending on this planet. I'm completely convinced that this will be a tectonic shift in many, many ways. And I'm not only positive uh, about this. Um, I have another raised hand, Ibrahim, and then we would also close this uh, part and put up the fire, uh, um, the fire site, and whoever wants to stay to have an informal chat, please feel free. Uh, Ibrahim, is your hand still raised or otherwise? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for... Oh, hi, uh, Ibrahim. Hi, hi. So also, I left the US last week, so I moved from Boston, from uh, Harvard to Israel, uh, based on what's going on in the, in the States. So it's very, you know, it's sad what's going on there. So um, actually, my, my question about what do you think about, you know, if we compare the democratic states and the authoritarian regimes in terms of transparency, I mean, are you sure that the numbers in, in, in China, as they already said, or they already, um, you know, uh, mentioned? And here is the question. If we don't believe in, in, uh, in these regimes, then what will happen in, in you know, in terms of, of dealing with, the, with this crisis? I mean, this crisis and this crisis right now and in the, in the, in the, in the future. 
So the question of transparency in uh, authoritarian and democratic regimes. And the second question about, or thing that I think about it, about the, um, what's called the collective responsibility. Till now, we don't have like lots of numbers of, uh, uh, in, in Africa. But what do you think, what do you predict that democratic, democratic states will do if we have a, a high number of coronavirus uh, in, in Africa? And the third, the third question is about minorities. I think that you know the question of minorities, minorities in, in crisis is very important. Uh, like in, in democratic states and other states. So what do you think about uh, uh, the question of, uh, of minorities and, you know, uh, the infection and what's going on in, in these countries in terms of, you know, health uh, uh, system and how the country will deal with these minorities in conflict zones and in, in, in different, in different contexts. Uh, Brigitta, you should invite for one of the next session Ibrahim uh, as a host and uh, he can put all these questions and can respond to them. Very briefly, uh, yeah. very briefly, I Ibrahim, uh, I don't believe in these numbers provided uh, by China. I never believed in it. I even believe not really the numbers which come out from, uh, from uh, uh, democratic countries, but China is, has also a command about statistics. And uh, it is a well-organized uh, autocratic state, uh, but uh, I don't believe it. Uh, nevertheless, it seems to be that uh, they uh, effectively counteracted uh, in a way uh, that there is no catastrophe, uh, which we could have expect uh, in a country with such an, uh, a numerous uh, population. Uh, I was sometimes thinking not only about Africa, but about countries like India or Pakistan. India and Pakistan, if the uh, virus and the infection wave will really roll over these countries with an uh, extremely fragile and to some extent non-existing health system, then we could see again what we have or uh, what our ancestors have seen in 1918 and 19 uh, in the Spanish influenza, where most of the people died in India, probably something between five and eight million people. This would be a clear disaster and it would be a challenge of the Western democracy as well, who very often clap on their own shoulders and uh, uh, so to say celebrating their normative superiority, how they would then react and support these countries. And this would be a an, uh, an super, super martial plan which would be needed for those countries and got uh, 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 so to say, uh, we have even even all these atheists and ignorance uh, agnostics like me that have to pray that uh, it will not really reach Africa and India and Pakistan. You uh, you mentioned an extremely interesting thing: minorities. We know it from the grand pestilentia, the pestilence in the Middle Ages, uh, when uh, the pest, uh, pestilence broke out. The first victims were always the Jews. And I, I tell this to a Palestinian, uh, before they did anything, they killed in Cologne or in other countries, uh, first of all, hundreds and hundreds of Jews, because they accused the minorities being, so to say, the conspirators and uh, who invented and launched uh, uh, the uh, pest, uh, pestilence. Uh, nevertheless, I believe uh, we are living in, in a somehow more enlightened age and societies. Therefore, uh, it will not be the same. But if uh, society is polarizing, if distributional struggles will um, emerge, 
I would also expect the first uh, victims will be minorities. And this plays against, uh, again, this social romanticism that out of the crisis we come, as, uh, come out as a very solidaristic society. I would like to see it, uh, but uh, alone, uh, uh, um, I don't have the belief that this will uh, uh, happen. Minority question, this is certainly something which would be in less economically less developed countries a major problem. I'm sure about it. In India, with these tremendous and powerful minorities of Muslims and uh, of other confessions, will uh, be Hindus, will be a battleground uh, for, or could be a battleground for these uh, uh, questions as well. Very interesting question. Thank you, Ibrahim. And um, so the last question of now the, the official part, let's say, goes uh, to Mexico. Erika, you raised your hand. Hi. Hi, Wolfgang. Hi, Erika. Thank you so much for this session. It was really interesting. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. When you were talking about India, I lived in India, and when I heard about the COVID, I thought, if you know if it breaks there in India, it will be like you know a massacre. Like it will be so bad. So it it, it made me thought think a lot about like there's like two you know uh, dimensions for this change. So there's like this global dimension that we have been discussing if it's if it's the end of globalization or what's going to happen. You know with multilateral multilateral agendas, uh, value chains, etc. Trade. And on the other hand, what I see the, the impact has been bigger at the national level, right? Like, you know, if countries are starting to face if they have a good health system, you know, if they have like communities that are organized, self-organized, if they have political power, etc. So I wonder if you could tell the future, uh, what do you think is going to be? on the terms of like uh, this geopolitical change, because now I think that the, you know, this tension between uh, China and the US has also been very big and very highlighted by the COVID, right? Uh, and on the other hand, uh, so I don't know how that's going to play out. If it's going, we're going to have this geopolitical change, I feel like Europe is in the middle of that. Like they have to decide who they want to play with somehow, whether with China or with the US. And at the national level, what do you think this will mean for countries, especially developing countries like, like where I live in Mexico and Latin America, where suddenly the crisis they have to do with poverty, with insecurity, with you know, lack of a big uh, social inequality are just becoming bigger and you can no longer ignore them. So what are your feelings regarding these two levels, um, levels of regimes? I'm not sure if I have a sufficient expertise uh, uh, to look at your country uh, and uh, to Latin America and what it means um, in terms of an accelerated race, geopolitical race. I would say countries like Mexico, so to say, uh, historically and uh, intuitively, would clinch closer to the United States. The question is whether the United States will accept it. There will be, as we know, uh, 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 there will be a stronger border control. And if uh, Trump, uh, who knows, if Trump survives in government, uh, then uh, he will probably even not really accept uh, Latin America as an, uh, as an component or as a partner in uh, his geopolitical fight. Latin America was to some extent, I uh, who was it? Uh, uh, our French colleague uh, told us the decoupling. It was to some extent decoupled uh, from uh, globalization. Simply, it was not uh, so important anymore uh, for uh, global factoring and trade and so forth. But your country has a specific problem 
uh, which I have mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, and this means a lack of stateness. You have, a, to some extent, as you probably would agree with, uh, you have a failing state in those areas where uh, the drug mafia is, so to say, uh, a kind of substitute of state power. And if you don't have um, a strong state capacity, a strong state will to act, then uh, you have not the best perspective coming out of the crisis. In geopolitical terms, I would say uh, China is not an alternative for Latin America, uh, for the United States, out of normative reasons, economic reasons, and on, on the neighborhood plays also an important role. And if you ask me, I'm critical against the United States, uh, but if I would be asked, uh, would, you be, uh, would you prefer to be a close partner to China and the United States, despite all the criticism, I would feel less uncomfortable uh, to ally with the United States than with China. Okay, thank you. Uh, this was an interesting closing remark, let's say. Um, we wanted to close whatever uh, we could call this the official part of this um, encounter. Uh, so famous last words before we put on the fire in the background. Um, Wolfgang, maybe on two levels. So one is on the content, the other one would be on the, on the space and on the process level. How did it feel to uh, encounter so many people in this different space? Uh, I'm intrigued uh, how it felt for you over there in Hof. When Annette and you invited me uh, to participate here in this series and conversation, I was a bit skeptical at the beginning. Uh, would I be passionate enough and emphatic enough uh, to present my thoughts if the people are not sitting around and I can communicate more directly. But I have to say this was, of course, uh, this, uh, I have to confess, this was the first time when I uh, did such a, a conversation, discussion, uh, or kind of little seminar here uh, uh, through Zoom. I'm, I got a bit, so to say, uh, incentivized uh, to do it more often and to uh, get more, uh, let's say, capacity to act with this medium. And I realized if I see myself here uh, on the screen and all these moves of my hands are not visible, uh, then uh, uh, I have to learn how to act in these uh, kind of medium. But I was very much pleased uh, to uh, talk to you, to hear the question, and some of the question will be with me during the next weeks and uh, will certainly inform me in my writing, and this is a positive uh, thing I take out. Uh, uh, last, you, you know, I'm a bit uh, one of these typical German critics, uh, what is something uh, which uh, doesn't create the real atmosphere that uh, you have to look at these little, little uh, uh, parts of the screen where you see uh, the people, you have to go like this uh, to see the people uh, somehow better. Uh, uh, probably there are uh, possibilities to then to zoom uh, the people who are talking uh, more into the center of the screen. Uh, nevertheless, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a good experience. This is lovely to hear. Yes, this element exists. It's called the speaker view. So whoever is uh, talking in this very moment could be the one that is uh, on your full screen 
and um, well, probably apart from all the bad things still to happen and that we're witnessing right now, I'd say one thing that will be probably staying is that we are, as Titus was putting um, up front, we are a bit lagging behind in Germany regarding uh, being digital and, 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 and using tech in a wise way because there is a wise way to do that. And probably in five years from now, it would be completely different. We would have different kinds of screens that we could just fold under our tables and put them up. And then whenever we want to be talking to somebody and maybe we could also smell and touch in a different way. Who knows? Maybe this is the leeway. Do we want it? <clears throat> Pardon me? Do we want it? Uh, I think it's not either or. It's, uh, you know, Me I, miss, and smelling. I, I, I miss cuddling and hugging people that I didn't um, cuddle and hug in a while. Post-corona. Sorry? Post-corona, probably, hugging people. Yeah, I mean, there will be a big, big... You get um, in Bavaria. <laughs> there will be a big need to, to keep, um, well, to, to fill all the, um, the void, but... I have to confess that I always believed uh, over the last 15 years that the digital space, if it's hosted well and if it's used wisely, it is. Um, it could be at least um, one way to really get in touch and connect. And um, so maybe we could be doing more of not only this kind of formats, but we as society um, be much more deliberative uh, around um, who we want to be talking to. And so this is, again, of course, the frequent flyer class that has been talking tonight. Um, normally we might be frequent flyers. Now we're not frequently flying, but we What's have- the past, tech. yeah. Yeah, well, we have the tech and there are many that are excluded of this kind of conversation. So we will have to think how we are going to do this kind of conversations with more when the quarantine is over. Um, Thank you very much for joining us. And um, uh, please leave us whatever message you want to uh, leave us as a feed forward. And um, we will um, compile a bit what Wolfgang has been producing uh, so actively over the last weeks and months and send it over to you uh, in, in just one document. So if you would like to get into some of the articles and content um, that he produced, uh, we will be sending out that. And thank you very much. And there is the fire burning already, Annette. So um, uh, also... We do, hope, we do hope that some of you stay and um, also with a glass of wine, Wolfgang, if you also want to stay a little bit more, that would be really great. Yes, and uh, what we also wanted to do, to so whoever has to leave now, uh, just open the mic and say goodbye uh, in whatever language you want to do or dance or um, sing and uh, the rest feel free to stay here and uh, I'm going to pour myself a bit more Chilean red wine. Thank you very much Wolfgang for being our guest. Thank you to all. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Fascinating. Really appreciate it.